Please notice with me this morning as we turn to Hebrews chapter 11, reading verse 39 and in verse 40 to begin our message this morning. I started uh, this week uh, working on just verse 40, and um, we're going to actually cover much more than that. And uh, notice with me, I'm titling the message, Made Perfect. I preached a message in 2012 titled, Be You Perfect, out of Matthew 5:48. I'm going to make some comments on that as we get into this. But notice as we read in verse 39 and 40, in reference to Old Testament and New Testament saints, we have these words, and he says, And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they, referring to the Old Testament saints, without us, referring to the New Testament saints, should not be uh, made perfect. In other words, he's saying that we all will be made perfect at the same time in the resurrection. Heavenly Father, we do ask this morning for Thy blessings to be upon the reading of Holy Scripture. We do pray this morning, Lord, that You would help us uh, as we look into this text and other verses as well. And Lord, bring us to a better understanding of Thy Word that we might be better servants for Thee. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, Amen, and You may be seated. As I said, I started out with verse 40 and working on this and and uh, verse 40 has to do with a future uh, perfection. But as I've studied this, I think that we need to cover a little bit more than just our future perfection in resurrection. As a matter of fact, when we come and looking at the subject, the word perfect, that we find uh, in the Word of God, we find that those who are made perfect spiritually, that is in salvation, they are told to be perfect in Matthew 5:48, practically speaking. And here in our verse, in verse 40, they're promised to be made perfect physically one day in resurrection with a spiritual body. Well, as we come here to this chapter, this chapter is describing to you and I the heroes of faith the great roll call of the faithful of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, we are told in Romans 15:4 that the things that are written before are for our learning, for our patience, our comfort, and our hope. And as we come here to chapter 11, this entire chapter uh, is dealing with the subject of faith. As a matter of fact, turn back with me to uh, the first part of this chapter. And I want you to notice that uh, when you look at this chapter, the first three verses are dealing with the definition of faith. And then from verse 4 through verse 40, we're giving, given here many examples of faithful individuals, men and women, in the Old Testament. And we see that throughout this chapter, there is recorded victories and achievements and success and every bit of this is given to you and I for encouragement. In other words, God gave us chapter 11, as well as the uh, rest of the New Testament, that we might be encouraged in our faith. As a matter of fact, in chapter 10 and in verse 38, it says here, Now the just shall live by faith. And it says, But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them which... Uh, who rather draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We find that in chapter 10, he says the just shall live by faith. This is in contrast to the unjust who do not live by faith in God and His Word. And we find that as we read the latter part of chapter 7, that the saints in the first century were going through much opposition. They had become a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions in verse 33. Uh, the Bible says here in verse 34, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing uh, in, in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. 
And so we find the, the, it says here, the just shall live by faith. When we step into chapter 11, in chapter 11 in verse 1, 2, and 3, again, we have the definition of faith. And uh, we find that faith is much more than just getting saved. How many of you learned that in your Christian life? Faith is much more than just getting saved. We find that it is a way of life. When we get saved, that's just the beginning of our faith in the journey that we have in this life. And then when you come to chapter 12, the first few verses in chapter 12 speaks of those who have crossed the finish line, waiting for resurrection. In chapter 12 and verse 1, he said, Wherefore, seeing we have also, uh, we also rather are compassed about with a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And he not only gives us this great cloud of witnesses, all of the believers, of the Old Testament to encourage us, but he also gives us Jesus Christ because he says in verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is thus set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we find that the saints of old are given for encouragement to you and I. They had faith, they lived a life of faith, and they have now crossed the finish line, waiting for the resurrection. Now, coming back to chapter 11, verse 1, I want to read the first three verses. And I want you to notice that as we come here, again, faith is absolutely essential for salvation, but it's also essential for successful living. Now, that's very important for us to understand. Faith is not a blind leap into the dark. We find here, beginning in verse 1, he said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice that faith is referred to as the substance. We know what the word substance means. Uh, he's, in other words, he's talking about of the reality of things hoped for. If we talked about someone's physical substance, their uh, finances, their homes, etc., we know what we're talking about. We find then that faith is the substance, it's the reality of things hoped for, and that faith is based upon the Word of God. Now think about this. He goes on to say in verse 2, and he says, and it's the evidence of things not seen. In other words, it is the proof of things not seen. And we know that when we talk about faith, again, this is not a blind leap into the dark, as many think. We know that in Romans 10, verse 17, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Where do we get our faith? We find that in Romans chapter 4, verse 19 through 21, that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God. In other words, that promise was based and founded upon what God had spoken to Abraham. In other words, it comes back to the Word of God. We find that even in Second Peter chapter 3, about verses 14 through 21, Peter makes reference to the fact that he was eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus Christ. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he saw the Lord transfigured, and he saw he heard the Father speak unto him, And then in those verses he said, and we also have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, we also. Uh, Peter says, I not only was eyewitness of Christ and his majesty and later his resurrection, but he says that we also have a more sure word of prophecy and he speaks of the word of God uh, that was given to holy men. In other words, they were given the inspired word of God. So this is the substance of our uh, faith. The Bible even speaks in 1 John chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. It refers to the Word of God as the record that God hath given uh, of His Son. So he says here clearly in these verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, that is the proof of things not seen, 
For by it the elders obtained a good report. We read that in verse 39. Twice they obtained a good report. And he says here in verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the Word of God. Again, we go back to this thing about the Word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So this whole chapter is dealing with faith. It gives us the definition of faith. And then it gives us from verse 4 to the end of the chapter... Many, many examples of those who lived by faith. Now notice in verse 6, and then we're going to go back to our text. Notice in verse 6, he says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Tremendous verse. Again, we see the issue without faith, It is impossible to please God. It's impossible to be saved. And it is impossible to live a successful Christian life without faith in God's Word. Now, notice with me as we go back to our passage. And let me this time read from verse 38. Notice with me from verse 38 to verse 40. Now, by the way, in this chapter you have many that are named saints of the Old Testament that he gives to us. For instance, Abel and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. And he goes on with a list including Moses and David and others. But you also have many saints here, uh, especially from verse 35 down to the end of this chapter, that are not named. So there's literally thousands of saints that are referred to in this chapter. Now, notice as we come back here to this passage, and and I'm going to be reading verse 38, 30, uh, and 39, uh, and 40 together. And let me make one more statement before I read this and get into our outline. You see our outline before you this morning. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to you, first of all, about positional perfection in salvation that is in Christ. And I'm going to be speaking to you this morning about a practical perfection in our Christian life. And number three, I'm going to be speaking to you about the promised perfection and resurrection in verse 40 that we just read a moment ago. But the word perfect, the word uh, perfection and the word uh, perfected uh, is used in the book of Hebrews a number of times. And it's used here about 12 times. And we're going to look at just a few of those. And again, we see the positional, the practical, and the promised perfection uh, of the saints of God in this one book, as well as other books of the Bible. Now again, I was only going to be preaching on being made perfect in resurrection, so that's now only going to be a third part of our sermon. Because I just feel like... Uh, I need to clarify uh, this word a little bit as we look at it today. The word perfect, uh, uh, perfection or perfected is used in reference to Christ. It's used in reference to the saints. It's also used in reference to the Old and the New Covenant in the book of Hebrews. Now, notice as we read these verses again, and And notice how the apostle here, at the end of this chapter, he brings together Old Testament and New Testament saints, including you and I. He brings them together. Notice now as we read in verse 38. He says, Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the the earth. And these all, that is Old Testament saints, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now, there's many promises that were given to the children of Israel. Some of them got, they got, and some of them they did not. Uh, we, uh, we know that they did obtain promises in verse 33. That is, they had victories and success. They also entered into the promised land. They lost it later. But he, there are promises that they never did forget. One of them is uh, the eternal inheritance, that is the resurrection of the physical body. The Old Testament saints are still waiting 
for resurrection, even though they're saved and they're with the Lord and would probably have white robes waiting, but they have not obtained the resurrection. Now notice verse 39, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, notice receive not the promise. And then he said in verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, I'm going to talk about that in a few moments, notice that they, without us, that is Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, the point in this passage is that all will be made perfect in resurrection at one time. There is a general resurrection whereby all will be made perfect. All will receive glorified bodies at that time. Now let's spend just a few moments on positional perfection. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. And notice here. Let's talk about positional perfection in salvation. And I'm going to be using basically Hebrews 10.14 as our text, even though we're going to read a few other verses in this chapter. Now, what do we mean by positional perfection? Well, the, the word perfect is used at least... Um, 99 times in the King James Bible. And it's used in a variety of ways. And the context must help us to understand the meaning and exactly what the Lord is talking about. You know, we, we know of statements, we've used statements like the, a perfect chord, a perfect grammar. How many of you know what we're talking about when we say that perfect grammar? Or a perfect pitch. I was telling Brother Avery, who had a man in our church years ago, he loved to tell people that he had a perfect pitch, which he really did not. But he thought he did. And so we understand what this word means. It's used in, in a variety of ways. The Bible speaks of a perfect heart. It speaks of a perfect weight in Proverbs. It speaks of a perfect law in Psalms 19. It speaks of a perfect man, perfect peace in Isaiah 26. It speaks of a perfect sacrifice, that is, Jesus Christ. It speaks of the perfect way, perfect beauty, and perfect understanding. So there's many synonyms that can be used with the word perfect. It can have the ideal of sincere, complete. Notice when we talk about something that is perfect, something that is whole, it's full, it's finished, it's complete. Uh, Something that is sound. Something that is without blemish, that is blameless, something that is mature. The Bible uses the word perfect in 1 Corinthians 2, and I believe in Philippians 3, in in reference to maturity. And so it's used in reference to that which is pure, that which is upright, that which is having reached the end. In other words, brought to completion or brought to perfection. So the context has to tell us exactly uh, uh, what this word is saying. And, and I'm going to use that. For instance, we're going to talk about positional perfection in Christ and salvation here in Hebrews 10.14. But we're also going to talk about a practical profession in our Christian life in Hebrews 6.1. And then we're going to go back to Hebrews 11.40 and talk about a promised perfection in resurrection. So again, we must look at the context to know exactly what the Lord is talking about. Now notice this. Let's read in Hebrews 10 verse 1, dealing with the Old Testament law and the sacrifices. And he said in verse 1, he said, "...the law having a shadow of good things to come..." And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there, thereunto perfect. So we see here in verse 1, he uses the word perfect. And he's saying that the law, the sacrifices, all of the ceremonies could never make someone perfect could never bring them into a full state of salvation and forgiveness. Now, notice with me as we drop down to verse 
10 in reference to Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he says in verse 4, he says, for it, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So clearly, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about forgiveness of sins could never have been accomplished through uh, the sacrifices of animals, even though they were commanded to do that, pointing to the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now notice with me as we come to verse 14. I'm, I'm sorry, begin reading in verse 10. And he's talking about those who are saved, those who are born again. Notice he said in verse 10, he said, By the which will we are sanctified. I want to place emphasis on that word as well. By, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Notice, once for all. He's talking about one perfect sacrifice. He says in verse 11, And every priest standeth dates daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice. Here it is again, which can never take away sin. But now notice in verse 12, he said, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now here it is. For by one offering, that is this perfect offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So he's talking about, here in this passage, he's talking about a perfection that is positional, it is in Christ. In other words, he's perfected forever through the sacrifice of Christ in contrast to the animal sacrifices that could never bring anyone to, to, to perfection. So the reason I call it positional perfection is that those who are sanctified and are in Christ, spiritually speaking, they have been perfected forever. In other words, they have been completed and made whole as far as eternal life is concerned. Again, he takes the Old Covenant in verses 1 through 4. He takes the New Covenant in verses 5 through 18. And then in verse 19 and 20, he says, Now we have access to God. In the New Covenant, in verses 16, 17, and 18, he's saying that we have forgiveness of sins, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the Old Covenant, with its sacrifices, rituals, symbols, and shadows, they, it could never take away sin. But those who are sanctified... Now what do we mean by this? The word sanctified means to be eternally set apart unto God. There's also three aspects of sanctification. There's a positional and a practical and then, then that ultimate sanctification and resurrection. So we find then those who have been sanctified have been perfected forever. In other words, they're saved by the grace of God. We have, the word sanctified has the ideal to be set apart unto God and, and set apart from the world. So, it, you know, in the Bible there's things, places, and people that are sanctified. The, the sanctuary was sanctified. The temple and the tabernacle, it was sanctified. What? It was set apart for the worship of God. And there were things that were sanctified. The priests were actually set apart from the rest of the people to give offerings and so forth. But this word is a wonderful word. It's used in verse 10, and it's also used in verse 14. And as you read through, and by the way, it's used again in chapter 2, verse 11, in referring to the saints, and it's used again in chapter 13, verse 12. But I'm going to read just a few verses. I'm not asking you to turn. But listen to this. In 1 Corinthians 1, and in verse 2, he said, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. And then he says again in verse 30 of this same chapter, he says in verse 30, he said, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We have all of this in Jesus Christ. In Christ, we have been set apart unto God, unto his service, 
and we've been set apart from the world. Even in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 10, and 11, he mentions twice that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says in verse 11, And such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Again, in 1 Peter 1, 2, we're sanctified by the Spirit. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, again, we are among those that are sanctified, and then Acts 26 and verse 18. So, here's what I'm saying, is that there is a positional sanctification, and one obtains that the day or the moment that they repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. The moment a person is born again, they are sanctified, spiritually speaking, and they have been Perfected, they have a spiritual sanctification, a positional sanctification, and they also have a positional perfection. Does that make sense? Because he says clearly in verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Okay? Now, turn with me to chapter 12 and notice here. Notice with me in chapter 12. I want to read this. And then we're going to turn to chapter 6. Now notice in chapter 12, again, there is a contrast between the physical, literal Mount Sinai in verses 18 through 24 and the heavenly mount. So I'm just going to begin reading in verse 22. Now notice this, speaking to the Christians in the first century. He said, but you're come unto Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now watch the carefully. He said, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now, I'm coming back. I read those three verses, by the way, to show you the spiritual aspect. The heavenly mount, heavenly city, New Jerusalem, and the church, and those who have their names written in heaven. But notice in verse 23, he said, "...to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, now watch carefully, and to God..." the judge of all, and to the spirits. Now notice this, to the spirits of just men made perfect. The spirits of just men made perfect are the society of the living dead. Those who are in the intermediate state, they are believers. So when they died, they did not go to hell. They went to heaven. They're in their intermediate state with robes and so forth, waiting, as in Romans, Revelation 6, by the way, verses 9, 10, 11, and they're waiting one day for the resurrection of their body. Does that make sense? So we find here that we see here the spirits of just men made perfect. So those who have a positional perfection, a positional sanctification, when they die, they don't lose that. They still are positionally perfect in Jesus Christ, waiting one day for physical perfection when they have a resurrected body. So first of all, Hebrews 10.14, we're talking about positional perfection in salvation, that is, in Christ dealing with our present state before God as believers. Now, let's come to chapter 6. In chapter 6, I want you to notice uh, the practical perfect, perfection in our Christian life. That is, again, the word perfect can refer to maturity. And, and in the case we're going to read now, there is to be maturity and doctrine and conduct in our Christian life. Now notice, I'm going, to, I'm going to come to chapter 6. And you know the reason I want to do this, and I know that this part has taken up quite a bit of the sermon, 
And uh, with the first two points, then we'll get to the third. That's the one I really wanted to focus in on. But to me, when I look at it this way, it makes a lot more sense. When I consider my perfection in Christ, and then I look at my Christian life, that He tells us to be perfect. I'm going to read a verse to you that I used uh, in 2012, and I preached an entire message titled, Be Ye Perfect. How many times do we say, oh, we're not perfect? Well, I, want you, I, we, I understand what people mean when they say that, but I want you to listen to this, and I'm reading in Matthew 5:48, and this is in the context, by the way, of having an attitude uh, of love toward even our enemies, not just our friends, but even our enemies. And we're to be like God when it comes to loving our enemies. And he says here in this passage, he says in verse 48, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven um, uh, is perfect. So if God says that you can be perfect, then I have to believe that you can. Now, in the context, he's talking about in practical things that we would be that we would be perfect again in our love, our attitude toward those that are lost, even our enemies. That we are to love our enemies. If God is this way and God says that we can do it, then I believe that we can. Okay. So now we're talking about practical perfection in the Christian life. We're talking about walking in maturity in doctrine and in conduct. I'm going to read in Hebrews 6 in just a moment. But think about some of these verses I'm going to give you. We're not going to turn to any of them. We find that in Ephesians 5.1, He said, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. In Genesis 6, 9, the first time the word perfect is used, the Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generation. In other words, when we look at the situation in the days of Noah, Noah was a man that walked in virtue. He walked in faith. He did what God told him to do. He was faithful to God. So in contrast to his generation, Noah was mature in the faith and walked with God. Genesis 17, 1, God told Abraham to be perfect. And in James 2, 22, we see the perfecting of his faith when he offered up Isaac, his son. Abraham had to grow as we have to grow, but his faith was made perfect by his obedience by his obedience to God's covenant and to, in Genesis 17, to circumcision. By the way, the Bible tells us in Job 1, verse 1 and verse 8, that Job, that he was perfect. In Genesis, not Genesis, but Job 2, verse 3, again, it says the same thing. So Job was perfect in the sense that he was wholly devoted to God and he feared God. That's how God referred to him as being perfect. David had a heart for God. And uh, even after David sinned, he was very quick to confess his sins. He did not justify his sins as most would. And we read about his confession in uh, two or three chapters in the book of Psalms, especially in Psalms 51. In Second Chronicles 16.9, we see a perfect heart. There, a perfect heart devoted wholly to God with no reservations. And the Lord is looking for those with a perfect heart. The perfect man is one whose heart is conformed to God's will and God's Word. So yes, I mean, this word is used in a variety of ways. And now we're looking at the Word in a practical way, in our Christian life. Again, he says in Matthew 5:48, "Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect." In other words, in the context, he's dealing with loving those around you and even loving your enemies. 
Alright? So we can be like God. We can be like children of God in that respect. So now let's consider in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. He says in verse 1, he said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Notice, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. What does he mean here? He's talking about perfection in a practical way. He just said in chapter 5, notice in chapter 5, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those uh, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What is he saying in chapter 5? He's saying, grow up, become mature in the faith. Walk in the faith. In other words, you, you need to, uh, some of you, he's saying, need to be taught the first principles. In other words, the elementary teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying you need to become mature in the faith. Well, what does he mean in chapter 6 and verse 1 when he says, therefore leaving the principles. Now, he's not saying throwing the principles away. The principles are the foundation of Christianity. And there's six of them give, given to us here in verse 1 and 2. There's six of these foundational principles given. It's repentance and it's faith toward God. It is the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. That is the, that is the first principles, the foundation of Christianity. Repentance and faith and things of that nature. So when he says in verse 6, he said, therefore leaving, the principles of the doctrine of Christ, he said, let us go on into perfection. He says, once we have these things settled and we know them, he's saying, let us grow in the faith. Let us go beyond this. Again, we find here they're exhorted to spiritually grow and become mature in the faith, that they would become full grown. That's very important. Even the Apostle Paul in in Ephesians 4 and in verse 11 and 12, he said he gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And he says, for the perfecting of the saints and the edifying of the body of Christ. And then he says in verse 13, till we all come unto a perfect man. So this thing about growing and becoming uh, perfected in our in our beliefs and in our walk and our conduct and in our speech. That's what he's talking about here. Let me read verse 1 again. He said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We are to look for a deeper meaning of the things of God. We are to know the breadth and width and the height and the depth of the things of God as in Ephesians 3. We're to come to fuller revelations of God, a spiritual walk with the Savior. We have the foundational truth, six principles given here. And he's saying, let's move forward. Let's grow. Let's grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's wanting us not to be spiritual babies. The Apostle Paul, when he talked to the Corinthians, he spoke to them. He spoke of this perfection in chapter 2, I believe it's verse 6, on us which are perfect. He said we can say certain things. Then he turns around in chapter 3 and speaks of their carnality. And they were as babes, you know, they were not uh, full grown. They had to take milk and could not handle the meat of the Word. In other words, this Word has the ideal of maturity to be perfect, 
to come unto perfection, to be perfected, to be mature in the faith. Let me show you how it's used again. Notice with me in chapter 2. I'm reading in chapter 2. Now, we're talking right now about practical perfection. Notice as we come to chapter 2, I'm reading in verse 10. He says here in verse 10, he says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain, that's Jesus, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, that will cause you to stop and think a little bit. You, are you saying that Jesus was made perfect through sufferings? We're talking about practically speaking now. Jesus was always perfect morally. We know that. But we're talking about the fact that He was made perfect through sufferings in that. He became the captain of our salvation. He completed and fulfilled God's plan of redemption for us in His sufferings. In other words, we would never had salvation if Christ hadn't suffered. So He was made perfect in this. Sort of like thinking about Joshua. Joshua endured the wilderness journey and that qualified him to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And so we see, we see here in this passage, again, by the way, chapter 5, if you're taking notes, verse 8 and 9, He's made perfect in resurrection. And then another passage that just came to, to me here this week, another passage is in Luke chapter 13, 32, and he speaks when he would be perfected, that is, when he would be raised from the dead. In other words, all things would be completed at that time, would be brought to its uh, final state and so forth so that we could have redemption. Does this make sense? There is a positional perfection that we have in Christ through the new birth. In other words, we have been set apart, been sanctified unto God. Then there is this practical perfection that we are to have in our Christian life as we walk day by day. He says to his people, he said, be you perfect, for I am perfect. As he says in 1 Peter, be you holy, for I am holy. So there is that perfection that we are to strive for in the Christian life. Even Jesus himself, through his sufferings, became perfect. He became qualified to save humanity through the blood that he shed at Calvary. All right, now let's come back to our text. Notice with me as we go back to Hebrews chapter 11. Now, I've had to go all the way around the woodshed to get back to the resurrection thought. But anyway, I, you, you may not get anything out of this, but I, I, when I look at this, and I take words in the Bible, again, you can read passages where that one passage will say that we are sanctified in Jesus Christ. But then you can read other passages. That would be like in Corinthians 1. But you can take other passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 where he says, sanctify yourself. Well, what does all of this mean? Well, in the context, one says that I'm sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. Another one says that I am sanctified by walking true to the Word of God. So, so that helps me when I put all of these together. The same is true of the word perfect. The word perfect. I can look at myself as being sanctified and perfect in Jesus Christ, showing me that my perfection in Christ is through the blood of Jesus. So I have that. That's mine. And, and I am perfected forever. You see, that's, that perfection gets me into the kingdom of God. Then I can look at the other side of perfection. As I walk through this journey of life, my Christian life, he sang to me, be perfect. He sang to me, be mature. Grow up. He sang to me, uh, to be complete. To be a, a complete Christian. In other words, be obedient to his word. Well, I can understand that. Because he's not saying that's how I'm saved. 
He's telling me as a Christian, as a saint who has been sanctified and perfected, now, hey, let's walk in perfection. Just like I am made holy in Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking, but He also tells me, practically speaking, be ye holy, for I am holy. See, when I put all this together, that in my mind, it may not for some of you, but in my mind, this, this helps me. Uh, and I'm not reading through a verse, and one verse says, you're sanctified, and another says, you need to be sanctified. Or one verse says, you're perfected forever, and another one says, you need to be perfect. So this helps me. So now let's come to the third aspect of this. Let's come back to our passage. And notice with me, now, as we come back to chapter 11 again, and I want to read chapter 11, I want to come back to verse 38, 39, and 40. Now, we're talking about the promised perfection in resurrection. What is it? It is the glorification of the saints in the last days. When Christ comes again... When Christ comes again and there is that resurrection and we receive a physical, literal, glorified body, then I am going to be eternally perfected in that sense. Now watch this. He says here beginning in verse 38 again, "...of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth." And by the way, think about the world was not worthy. Think about this. All people think, think they're so great in whatever and they want to persecute Christians and keep them uh, suppressed and poor and everything else. The world is not even worthy of the poorest Christians that ever walked on the face of this earth. You know. And, and notice he goes on to say, and these all, all of the Old Testament saints, every one of them, he said, and these all having obtained a good report. Please think about that. They obtained a good report. That's an amazing statement. We find here that, uh, and, and he also says, and they received not the promise. Now they did get some promises. The children of Israel finally got the promised land, even though it was temporary because of the rebellion. They had promises of victory, winning battles and victory in many ways like David and Goliath and other examples. But notice he says here, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They did not receive the promise of the resurrection. Even the saints that are dead, even those that were buried last week, or those were buried in the days of Abraham and Sarah. All of them are waiting in an intermediate state with the Lord. They're waiting for the final resurrection in the last day. And what he's telling us in this passage is that they had faith, they lived this faith, and the world was not even worthy of them, but there's one thing that they did not get, and that is a resurrected body and the eternal inheritance that's promised them out there. They're still waiting for that. Now watch this, he says in verse 40. He says, God having provided some better thing for us. And let me talk about that just for a moment. What is this some better thing for us New Testament saints? Well, all this means is that we have an advantage in, in seeing the reality of Christ in the gospel. Old Testament saints look forward to Christ's coming. You and I, we look back and we have the completed canon of Scripture. And so when we, when we consider this, Old Testament saints, they had shadows and types, but they were looking unto Christ to come. As a matter of fact, in, in, in chapter 8 and verse 6, he speaks of a better covenant. The book of Hebrews is all about that which is better. A better covenant, a better sacrifice, a better priesthood. It's all about that which is better. Now, the Old Testament saints, they had types and shadows and sacrifices, 
and, and they knew of the coming Savior, but they didn't have the reality of it. We have the fulfillment and accomplishments of Calvary. And we rest in that. And even in Hebrews 9.15, even in Hebrews 9.15, clearly we see in that passage that Christ was not only the mediator for our sins, but He was the mediator for the sins of those in the Old Testament. Why? Because animal sacrifices has never saved anyone. So He's the mediator. And by the way, there's a, there's a passage. I had one quote this morning. And, and this is to go with Hebrews 12, 23 that we read a moment ago of, of the spirits of just men made perfect. And this quote goes like this. Made just by God, which have put off their bodies and left the filth of this world no longer subject to infirmities of the flesh. In other words, those that had positional justification and positional sanctification and perfection, when they died, they still have that. But they put off the filth of this world and the Adamic body that they lived in and waiting one day for a resurrection. So, when we look at this, we see that the Old Testament saints, they had faith, they believed in the coming Messiah. Abraham, according to Galatians 3.8, heard the Gospel. I mean, he knew something about the Gospel. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 13 and verse 17 The Lord Jesus told His disciples, He said, the prophets would have loved to seen the things that you see now and that you're experiencing. Then in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, it spoke of the prophets and so forth, searching the Scriptures, looking into His sufferings and His glory, trying to understand them. We have the completed canon of Scripture, the full revelation. And so that's what he means here when he says in verse 40, and having provided some better thing for us. It's not that we're better than they are, but we have more revelation than they had. We're looking back now at the things that were accomplished for us, and they were looking ahead for the coming Savior. Now, let's read verse 40 again and notice here. It says, verse 40, And having provided some better thing for us, now watch this carefully, that they, Old Testament saints, that they without us, New Testament saints, that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, the Old Testament saints, they were not made perfect perfect as far as resurrection and a resurrected body is concerned. They never got it. All the saints who have died, they're, 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 they have never received that glorified body. Now, that's what we're going to talk about in the remaining of the passage. There is a, there is a general resurrection in the, in the last day when Christ comes. I got a sermon we preached last year titled The Last Day. Not last days, but the last day. And that last day is the coming of Jesus Christ. It's the second coming. And the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints will be made perfect in resurrection with glorified, physical, resurrected bodies at the same time. Now, Let's look at some verses on this. Turn with me to, you can turn loose of Hebrews and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just going to go through as many as I can in the last hour and a half that we have. Notice in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. These will be familiar verses to you, but still yet I want to go through some of them. Notice in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians chapter 1. Reading in verse 9. He says, How, and by the way, if you're taking notes, write down chapter 3, verse 15. He says in verse 9, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself. Now watch this. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that is the eternal state of things. That's, when, that's the last day, the second coming, when new heavens, new earth, New city, New Jerusalem, that's when everything is wrapped up. Now watch this. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one, what's the next few words? All things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His will. One day in resurrection, when Christ comes, He will bring all things together. All saints, beginning with Adam and Eve, unto the end, whenever that will be, all will be raised at the same time. All will receive glorified bodies. All who have been made perfect spiritually in Christ, all will be made perfect, think about this, in resurrection, because they will have their glorified bodies and they will be complete. All things will be brought to maturity. All things will be finished at that time. There will be no more that needs to be done. Again, saints resurrected, new heavens, new earth, New city, new Jerusalem, all things will be completed and brought to its perfection. Notice with me as we read in Romans chapter 8. It's illustrated here as well. In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading beginning in verse 22. I'm actually skipping some verses to just get to the exact passage that I want. Notice in verse 22. Beginning here, he said, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Now watch this. What are we waiting for? He says, We're waiting for the adoption to wit that is to be made known. Notice the redemption of our body. He goes on to talk about our hope that is that we can't see. And but but it's still there. But notice here, we see that we are now waiting. We are waiting. The Old Testament saints are waiting. We who are alive are waiting. Those who have died, even this week, they are waiting for the redemption of the body. The body has never been redeemed yet. The body will go into the grave. The body will decompose. And we're waiting for that. Notice again as we come to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now here's the all things working together, verse 29 and 30. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed. Well, we're being conformed now, but ultimately in resurrection. He said to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them He also called. Whom He called, them He also justified. And whom He justified, notice, them He also glorified. See, we're talking about the glorification of the saints of God. Whether Old or New Testament, one day we all receive that glorified body in resurrection at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And He tells us in the remaining of this chapter, He says there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is secure and that is promised. That's why all the Old Testament saints, they never even seen Jesus Christ, but they have the promise of God. They have the record of God. They have the testimony of God. So they put their hope in something that was coming in the future. In other words, think about the first coming of Christ was still in their future. It's in our past. But they had faith in that. And they also had faith in the second coming, even though they may not have known the details of it. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Whole chapter dealing with resurrection. The whole chapter dealing with resurrection. Beginning in verse 50. He says in verse 50, He said, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doeth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now think about this. Even Job, 
spoke of a change. Job said in Job 14.14, 14, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Job knew that there's a resurrection after death. Abraham knew this. In Matthew 8, verse 11, Many shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. We'll all be raised at the same time. We'll all be in the same kingdom. And we'll all be associated with that. In other words, we'll receive our glorified body. You'll get to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and eat with them. We're all going to have a glorified body. David in Acts 2 and Psalm 16 knew that there was a resurrection. Notice with me, as we read on, he said in verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There's that word again. Why do we need to be changed? Because we're dying. Pointed a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. He says in verse 53, For this corruptible, that is, this body we live in, well, this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That's quoted from Isaiah 25, 8. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking of the fact that this corruption must put on incorruption. This mortal, that is this body, must put on immortality. In other words, there is going to be a resurrection when Christ comes, a trumpet is blown, and He tells us that all... All shall be changed. We shall be glorified. Let me put it as in Hebrews 11:40. We shall be made perfect. Physically speaking, we will be made perfect. Turn with me to First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians in chapter four. Notice here. First Thessalonians chapter four, beginning in verse 13 down to verse 18. He says in this passage, he says, But I would not have you ignorant, to be ignorant rather, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that is, those who have died, that you soar not even as others which have no hope. Those who die in Christ have hope. He said, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Notice they're with him, not their physical body. It's in the grave, decomposing. But he notice in verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now think about it. Them which are asleep is not only New Testament saints, but it's the Old Testament saints as well. We shall not precede them, nor shall we hinder them from being raised from the dead. All will be raised at the same time. Verse 16. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be of the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If we were to be alive when Christ comes, that is a possibility, I don't know how probable it is, but it's a possibility. If we were alive when Christ comes, we're not going to get a head start on anybody. Those that are dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, you know, shall be caught up together with them. And so when Christ comes, if we are alive, guess what? Abraham is going to be raised at the same time. Adam and Eve is going to be raised at the same time. We're not going to precede them, nor are we going to hinder them. There is that general resurrection that will take place one day. Turn with me, please, to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll tell you what, let's, let me just give you this one. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 7 through 10. And by the way, First Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 11 also continues the thought that we just read 
Turn with me, please, to Philippians 3. In Philippians chapter 3. Aren't you glad that you got a promise of being made perfect? Now, I know I enjoy life. I enjoy the things that God has given us in this life. But also, I realize that this whole world is under a curse, including our physical bodies. My soul and spirit has already been redeemed and sanctified and made perfect, but this body hasn't been saved yet. All I can do is keep it under control, but one day we will be made perfect in resurrection. Glorified bodies that will never ever desire to sin and, and to, and, and, I mean, it's just going to be perfect in every way. Notice in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, that for our conversation, by the way, this is in contrast to the enemies of the cross in the previous verses, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord of Jesus Christ, who shall change. See, we keep seeing that. We see that in Job. We see that here in the New Testament in Corinthians. Who shall change our vile body, that is, make it perfect, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. There is a change coming. There is a perfection coming that is associated with our physical bodies. Turn with me again, 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to close in just a few moments in John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 3. You see, we may not understand everything about the intermediate state of the saints of God, but we know they're with the Lord. We may not understand everything there is even about the coming resurrection, but we got many verses that tells us that is so. And we can put together a few facts and a few uh, truths about this. There may still be some mystery there, but we have plenty of Scripture, and I've only read a few of them. Now look here again, chapter 3 of 1 John. Behold, I'm beginning in verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be. Talking about resurrection. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. See, again, we keep putting these pieces together, and and God gives us enough that we can hang on to and trust and know that we're secure in Him. And he says in verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Turn to the last passage. I'm reading in John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Somebody ought to do a holy dance. Say amen, hallelujah, or something. Do a Davidic dance this morning because... This is some precious truth that God has given to us. And we're all going to the same place. The other day I've seen a few guys, you know, flexing their muscles and, you know, and I, I, listen, I'm not against exercise and trying to, you know, have a healthy body. I'm not against that at all. I'm for that. But flexing those muscles and I, I was in a, uh, over in Biloxi and I seen them flexing those muscles and I'm thinking, I want to see you 50 years from now. You'd be bent over like this. You know, your back's gone out. Your arms are about half the size they used to be in one day. We're all going to that grave. Going to that grave. Don't matter how beautiful anyone is is or how strong there is. I've seen a man recently that 270 pounds, he is a, um, he is a professional weight lifter, that kind of thing. And boy, does he think he's something probably about 40 years of age, and, um, and a sodomite on top of that. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, man, give it, give it a few years. Give it a few years down the road. John chapter 5, we're closing here. 
John chapter 5. Notice as we come here. Again, I'm just stressing to you that there is a time when we will be made perfect in resurrection. All the saints of God. David died at 70. We'll receive a glorified body. Adam lived many hundreds of years. Still died, received a glorified body. What Abraham lived to about 175, I believe. He still died, received a glorified body one day. Moses lived to be 120 years of age. He'll receive a glorified body one day. He was buried. Remember where God buried him at. And all of those saints one day will receive a glorified body. I think about in John 11:24, Jesus talking about the resurrection. He said in verse 25, I am the resurrection and life and so forth. And Martha, in, in that chapter, and of course Lazarus is dead at the time, and Martha said, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She said, I know about that. But she was concerned about her brother right then and there. Wanting the Lord to raise him from the dead. And also in chapter 12, we have the passage where it says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken you, the same shall judge him in the last day. Saints will be raised in the last day. The lost will be judged and be cast into the lake of fire. John chapter 5, closing here in this passage. Notice as we come here to verse 28 and 29. These are the only two verses I'll read in this passage. He says here in verse 28 and 29, and by the way, these are repeated again in Acts 24. I forget the verse. I think it's verse 32. It's repeated again in other places. But notice what he says in verse 28 and 29. Would you stand with me as we read these last two verses, 28 and 29? The Lord Jesus, He makes many other statements in this context, but verse 28 and 29. He said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. All. Notice He said in verse 29, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There is the resurrection of all men. All men. Those who have trusted Christ, they will be raised unto life. Called the resurrection of life. It's called made perfect. It's called uh, to be changed. To be glorified. But there's also that resurrection of damnation. I hope this has been a blessing to you, an encouragement to you. Hebrews 11 is given to us to encourage us in the faith. All of those who have lived the journey. By the way, there's some of them won victories and shut the mouth of lions, won battles, seen their dead raised. But there's others who were sawn asunder, persecuted, lived in caves, and dens and whatever. So all the saints of the Old Testament, he says, they will be raised from the dead to be made perfect. At the same time, you and I will be raised from the dead and made perfect. What a truth that we find in Holy Scripture. The whole family of God, beginning with Adam and Eve, until the end of time, all brought together in the new heavens, the new earth, and the new city, New Jerusalem. Father, we thank You for Your love and mercy to us. We thank You for the eternal redemption that You've, Lord, provided for us. We thank Thee this morning that Jesus Himself, that was perfect, came and through sufferings became perfect in His office to redeem humanity. Father, we thank You for the coming glory. Help us to live as we should here and enjoy this life and serve You. But Lord, thank You for the promise of resurrection into life and to be made perfect. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.